Good evening. We've long suspected Hong Kong's population is growing fast and getting older, and tonight we have confirmation. Figures out today also show there are significantly more women than men, and almost one in three men took mainland brides in 2006. ATV's Nancy Ju reports. If you noticed our city becoming more crowded in recent years, you are right. Government figures out today show Hong Kong's population reached 6.9 million at the end of last year. That's a rise of 62,900 people in 2006. The sex ratio is also changing. Excluding foreign domestic helpers, the ratio at the end of last year stood at 961 males for every 1,000 females. Ten years ago, there were 37 more males for every 1,000 females. More than 18,000 men who got married last year, or 30 percent of the total, tied not with mainland women. That's a staggering seven times higher than 10 years ago. And there's a confirmation of an aging population with a medium age rising from 34 to 39 over the past decade. Officials say that's because birth and death rates are both falling. The number of people in an average household dropped from 3.3 to 3, mainly because of Hong Kong's notoriously low fertility rate over the past decade. Nancy Chu, ATV News. Well, there are signs tonight of a mortgage war kicking off between banks again. Banking giant HSBC announced today it will lower its mortgage rates until the end of April this year in a move similar to the one it made around this time last year. HSBC has some good news for home buyers, and it may not just affect those choosing to take out mortgages with a banking giant, as the last time they made a similar move, many other local banks followed. Today, the bank announced that until the end of April, it will offer a mortgage rate of 4.87%. That's 2.88% lower than their current rate. You would have noticed in, recently that the activities in the property markets has indeed picked up. And this is actually the right timing to, to offer something for the customers who are considering to purchase and to, and to go on board. When Hong Kong's top lender cut mortgage rates last February in a move to gain more market share, many local banks followed and a rate war ensued. This cut may have a similar effect. DBS, which is currently offering promotional mortgages until the end of February, says it will review its rate and announce a new offer when the promotion ends. Chongqing Bank, which currently offers home buyers mortgages at 4.85%, also says it will review its rate in the short term. Police are trying to find out how a car without a driver ended up in Victoria Harbour this morning. The car had been reported stolen and the owner is helping to investigate the matter. ATV's Nancy Ju reports. It's not every day you see scenes like this. A luxury car being hauled out of Victoria Harbour. A witness reported seeing the vehicle plunge into the water near Davis Street in Western District at about 7 this morning. Police and firemen raced to the scene and divers were sent in to find out if anyone was trapped in the car. But no one was found. The man who caught the police said he heard a loud bang and saw the car sink. It took four hours to recover the vehicle. Initial investigations show the car was reported missing last month from a garage near Fairview Park Boulevard in Yunlong. Police have contacted the owner of the vehicle to get more information. Investigations are also underway into a tragic accident on the Chumun Highway yesterday evening. A three-month-old baby and his parents died when their car ran out of control and hit a concrete barrier. The wrecked vehicle has been towed back to the Kuaixing Vehicle Pound. Nancy Ju, ATV News. Two dead birds found in Kowloon City and Happy Valley last week have tested positive for the H5 virus, which causes avian flu. More tests are being carried out on the two munias to confirm the findings. Health officials have warned people to avoid contact with birds and live poultry as a precaution against bird flu. Turning overseas, and at least, at least 16 people, including three children, were killed in a massive fire that broke out on an Indonesian ferry early this morning. Rescue boats rushed to the stricken vessel to rescue hundreds of passengers on board, many of whom suffered severe burns. Mary Lloyd has more. 
flames engulfed the ferry shortly after it left the Indonesian capital Jakarta for Bangka Island off Sumatra. It was about 5 in the morning and the Lavina 1 was about 80 kilometers from port when people began scrambling to escape the fire. Most were asleep when it started and some recall being awoken by the alarmed cries of other passengers. Records show 228 passengers were on board, but may not have taken into account the drivers of about 50 vehicles on the boat. Boats are often overloaded in Indonesia and their logs inaccurate. More than 200 people have been rescued, many with severe burns. They were picked up by nearby boats and rescue vessels sent to the scene and found on a nearby island along with some of the dead. Rescuers are now searching for any survivors who may have jumped into the water to escape the heat. Two children and a baby are reported among the victims of the fire. Ferries are a popular way to get between Indonesia's more than 17,000 islands, but safety standards are low. A ferry with about 600 people on board sank off the north coast of Java Island in December, and only 250 people survived. President Susilo Bangbang Yuriono has set up a group to investigate and improve transport safety. Mary Lloyd, ATV News. Britain says Prince Harry, who is third in the line to the throne, will be sent to Iraq with his regiment in May and stay there for six months. The last British royal to be sent to a war zone was one of his uncles, Prince Andrew, who served in the Falklands War in 1982. News of Harry's deployment comes a day after Prime Minister Tony Blair announced Britain will withdraw 1,600 of its troops from their base near Basra. The move has been hailed as a sign the situation is improving in Iraq, but many are warning the soldiers will leave a divided city threatened by sectarian violence. The south of Iraq has turned into a battleground for rival Shiite militias who dominate here despite the presence of British troops. Well-armed militiamen like these fighters from the powerful Mehdi army compete for control of this oil-rich land. Seen here when they briefly seized the southern city of Amara last October in a brazen display of military muscle. It is these militias and no longer British troops that are the law here. When the British started, they were very much a part of the community. And by the end, they had conceded great spaces to local militias and they were more into regular routines and not the reassuring presence they had started with. The soldiers that began their mission here with a friendly posture and soft hats hoped to build on the welcome invading forces received in much of the south. But they were forced to swap their berets for helmets and pull back into their bases as their troops repeatedly came under attack. By September 2005, when these dramatic images were seen around the world, it was clear British forces in Basra had worn out their welcome. Crowds of locals vented their anger against them with petrol bombs and stones. I believe that the British now see that they are more part of the problem than of the solution and as such they should get out. The withdrawal comes as no surprise to U.S. commanders here, one of whom told me the British haven't been in control of the South for some time. However, there is concern that this will give neighboring Iran free reign to continue its support of these powerful militias. Lara Logan, CBS News, Baghdad. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has threatened to haul Iran back before the U.N. Security Council after it ignored a deadline to suspend its uranium enrichment program. World leaders also hit out at Tehran, but the Iranians are defiant that they have a right to carry on with their nuclear work. ATV's Mary Lloyd has more. The Iranians have unfortunately not acceded to the uh, international community's uh, demands. Yesterday's deadline set by the UN Security Council for Tehran to freeze its uranium enrichment program came and went without the Iranians budging. Earlier in the week, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said they would shut it down if Western powers did the same, but that's not something they are likely to give a second thought to. I would strongly urge the Iranian authorities to comply, uh, first of all, fully with Security Council resolution. Limited sanctions were imposed on Iran in December, but did little to get them in line. They were also offered a package of incentives to shut down the program, and U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said that should be enough for them to do as the international community wants. I think we're all still hopeful that uh, the day is going to come when the Iranians decide to pursue that course rather than one of confrontation. 
Iranian Foreign Minister Manishim Mataki has made it clear Iran would prefer diplomacy to conflict, but said they were ready for both. It needs political will by all parties to solve this issue. Despite the tough talk, Rice, along with her German counterpart, did not close the door on diplomacy. While Russia said it and France want to be sure the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty isn't breached. The International Atomic Energy Agency has still not been able to conclude that Iran's program, which Tehran insists is to produce power, not weapons, is entirely peaceful. Fear of Iran's program has been made worse by Ahmadinejad's statements about wiping Israel from the map. The international community will have to uh, think of additional measures in order to influence the Iranians uh, to change uh, the basic position. Israel has not ruled out military action against Iran. The Security Council is so far undecided what to do next. Mary Lloyd, ATV News. Political leaders in Italy are in crisis talks after the shock resignation of Prime Minister Romano Prodi. Prodi resigned last night after losing a key foreign policy vote that covered Italy's troop deployments to Afghanistan and the expansion of U.S. military bases in northern Italy. The government failed by just two votes to get backing for its foreign policy program after many of its communist allies who are opposed to military action abstained. For more local news now, and Chief Executive Candidate Alan, Alan Leong said today he will attend the second election debate next month, but there's still no word on whether his incumbent rival Donald Jung will take part. Organizers of the forum are mostly pan-Democrats, and they say if Jung refuses to attend, he will owe them an explanation. ATV's Leslie Tang reports. Donald Zhang and Alan Leong will square off in a debate on the 1st of March, but a second showdown is less certain. Debate organizers have been left hanging with no official word from Zhang on whether he will show up for the planned 7th of March forum. They sent Zhang a second invitation yesterday, but have not received a response. Organizer Charles Mock said that if the chief executive refuses to join the debate, he will owe them an explanation. We feel disappointed, and uh, I also feel that uh, Mr. Chang and his office should give us a reason if he doesn't show up, uh, if he doesn't accept the, uh, our, our invitation. Uh, I, I think the, a, a non-committal answer is, is definitely not enough, especially now that we're, we're into this stage of the election. Civic Party challenger Leong has already agreed to take part in both debates. The second forum is being organized by more than 100 election committee members who are mostly from the pan-democratic camp. Mock said they plan to expand the debate to allow more public participation. Leslie Tang, ATV News. Taiwan's parliamentary speaker and possible presidential candidate Wang Jingping announced plans today to visit top mainland leaders in Beijing. The statement came as the presidential race intensified when a key Democratic Progressive Party member entered the race for the top job. Taiwan's Democratic Party chairman Yu Shi Kun was in a confident mood today as he announced in his hometown of Ilan that he would seek his party's nomination in the 2008 presidential race. Yu, who served as Taiwan's premier in 2000 and again between 2002 and 2005, joined another former premier, Frank Xie, in the race for the DPP presidential ticket. He is a strong advocate of Taiwanese independence and says he would insist on the island's sovereignty when dealing with Beijing in a gesture to pro-independent supporters in the DPP. But despite the political posturing, Yu is considered a long shot behind Xie, Vice President Annette Liu, and current Premier Su Tung Chang, who has yet to announce his candidacy. Last week, former Kuomintang Party Chairman and Taipei Mayor Ma ying Zhou announced he would seek the KMT's presidential nomination. Ma also met his KMT rival Wang Jingping last week to avoid a party split. But all the signs suggest the parliamentary speaker will make his own bid for the presidency. Taiwan's relations with the mainland will be a major issue during next year's presidential campaigns. And like you, Wang favors improved ties with Beijing. And today, Taiwan's press reported he will visit the mainland and meet President Hu Jintao in March. Wang has argued that the independence-leaning policies of the ruling DPP have damaged Taiwan's economy and that the problems can only be solved by improving links between Beijing and Taipei. 
Well, it's time now for a look at sports, and Liverpool fans are celebrating their team's big victory. On a night of draws, Liverpool ended defending champion Barcelona's 17-match unbeaten run at home in the Champions League. ATV's Melanie Haneke reports. Liverpool's Craig Bellamy and John Artie Risa put a week of trouble behind them to lead Liverpool past Barcelona 2-1. Despite the victory, Liverpool are cautious about disposing their successors as European champions. It's clear that we have a good chance now, but as I said before, no, we need to be careful. And Barcelona is really good playing counter-attack. They have very good offensive players and then we need to do our best also in Anfield. Barcelona will look to turn the tie around in two weeks' time in Liverpool. Jose Mourinho's Chelsea held his former club, FC Porto, to a 1-1 draw. Andrei Shevchenko scored the game-tying goal. Chelsea has struggled with a string of injuries, and Captain John Terry is the latest to be ruled out of Sunday's League Cup final after he suffered an ankle injury last night. I think it's a, it's a good result. The, 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 the tie will be, will be solved in, in, in London, Stamford Bridge, and... Um, I'm not saying 100% we beat Porto, but I'm saying we are very confident and we are in a good situation. In other action, Lyon was held 0-0 at AS Roma, while Inter Milan was held 2-2 by Valencia. Turning to other sports news now, starting in the NBA, LeBron James held the Cleveland Cavaliers declaw the Toronto Raptors. Here's Melanie again. LeBron James led the Cleveland Cavaliers with 29 points as the team snapped Toronto's eight-game home win streak, beating the Raptors 86-85. James made a driving dunk with five minutes to go to push the Cavs ahead 80-76. Anthony Parker sunk a 23-foot jumper to make it 83-80 Raps. With Toronto leading 85-84 and 16 seconds left on the clock, Anderson Vario put up the final two points of the night to seal the win for Cleveland. Henrik Zetterberg broke a 2-2 deadlock in the third period as the Detroit Red Wings skated past the Chicago Blackhawks for 2 The win made it 13 consecutive victories on home ice for the Red Wings, one win shy of their franchise record streak set in the 1964-65 season. Detroit also climbed over Idle Nashville and back into first place in the Central Division and have the best point total in the Western Conference with 84. One match down, five to go if the world's number one player wants to stretch his PGA Tour winning streak to eight. Tiger Woods relied on a big par save early and a near ace on the 14th to beat Ryder Cup teammate J.J. Henry three and two at the match play championship in Arizona. Phil Mickelson hold a 35-foot birdie putt on the 13th hole to square the match, then won the 14th and 16th with pars and hung on for a one-up victory over Richard Green. While Ernie Els made a quick exit, missing four putts inside 10 feet and losing four and two to Bradley Dredge. And tonight's winning mark six numbers are 2, 8, 11, 18, 32, 39, and the extra number is 46.